One. Dropship Endeavour, Nadir Jump Point, Gladius System, Sky March, Federated Commonwealth. Eighteen o five hundred hours, ninth of May, thirty fifty seven. Alexander Carlyle listened to the soft, lonely peep of the vital signs recorder, the periodic hiss click of the respirator, the low voiced hum of the refrigeration units that kept the medical stasis capsule's interior at a chilly eight degrees Celsius, and he wanted to scream. More and more during these past few days, that sleek oblong capsule with its coils of wires and power feeds had been taking on in Alex's mind the cool, dark proportions of a coffin. Live, he commanded, the thought loud in his mind. You're going to live, damn it. You're going to live. Damn, damn, damn. So far, he'd managed to put a careful mask over his feelings, but that mask was at every moment in danger of slipping, and as the days trickled past, it was becoming harder and harder to maintain it. Grace and Deaf Carlyle, his father, was encased inside the capsule's gleaming ceramic and plastic embrace, his features paste white and deaf still just visible through the fogged transparency that covered his face. Half of that face, the left side, was further shrouded by the silver-gray metal of a bioplas wound seal. The right side was blotched and puckered by second-degree burns that were still only imperfectly healed. The Legion's medtechs had decided to put Carlyle into cryosuspension, in order to stabilize his more serious injuries, even though his reduced heart rate and drastically lowered body temperature slowed the healing of his minor wounds. Right now, medtech Ellen Jamieson had told him days before, all we can really do is try to keep him alive. We can't begin to fix everything that's wrong here on the dropship. We need to get him back to Glengarry. Initially, Alex had been cushioned by a sense of unreality, a detachment that said this couldn't have happened to his father. Grace and Deaf Carlyle had always been a vital, active, keenly intelligent man. To see him reduced to this state, neither wholly dead nor wholly alive, sealed helpless and unmoving inside the coffin-like shell of the stasis capsule, it was as though Alex was being forced to witness the drawn-out death and decomposition of someone else, a stranger. This couldn't be his father. As the days passed, though, he'd gradually begun to accept the reality of this situation. With acceptance had come pain. No one blamed him for his father's condition. No one who'd been willing to confront him face to face at any rate. Alex had spent much of the past two weeks trying to convince himself that his father's wounds were not his fault, and at times, at least, he had been nearly successful. He knew now, for instance, that it wasn't his being late in hitting the enemy forces at Falkirk that had led to the elder Carlyle's brush with death. His father had been betrayed on the battlefield in the moment of victory by one of his own men a mole evidently planted within the legion by enemies as yet unknown. Grayson had been blasted at nearly point-blank range from behind, then seriously burned when he tried to climb out of the wreckage of his victor. Most of the wounds he'd suffered had been the result of an unshielded near-miss by the PPC of the traitor Zeus. He'd lost his left arm, removed by the Metex shortly after the battle. Worse, at least from any mech warrior's point of view, there was a possibility that he'd never be able to pilot a mech again. No one, least of all Alex, was looking at any of that closely now, though since there was still no guarantee that the Metex would even be able to save his life. 
if they could get him back to the med facilities at the Legion's Glengarry base, then maybe. What gnawed most at Alex was the knowledge that he'd been at least partially responsible for bringing his father to Caledonia in the first place, and for the decision that had made the Great Death Legion change sides. From that of the legitimate government, under the bloody-handed Wilmarth, to that of the political and religious rebels who'd been fighting Wilmarth for months. Even now, knowing what he knew, Alex couldn't see how his father or he could have made any other choices. Governor Wilmarth had been a vicious and sadistic monster in human guise. To have obeyed his orders would have meant turning the Legion's battle mechs against all but defenseless civilians in a brutal mass slaughter. To obey that kind of order was unthinkable, no matter what the cost. At the same time, though, it was impossible not to remember that if the Legion had obeyed Wilmarth, the Battle of Falkirk would have never been fought, and his father would not be packed away in a chilled ceramic tube, like a bloody slab of Glengarian aurochs. What else could I have done? Alex's hands curled into fists, squeezing so hard the nails bit the flesh of his palms. He shook his head slowly, trying to clear it of the dark and accusing thoughts. Damn it! What else could I have possibly done? A hand descended, resting itself on his shoulder, with a surprisingly light, almost apologetic touch. Alex turned, startled. Major Davis McCall stood at his side. Aye, it is me, lad, the big man said. Sorry to bother ya, but there's a bit we a trouble you should know about. Gently, Alex pushed himself back from the med capsule, turning to snag a handhold and brace himself against the possibility of drifting free. The endeavor was in microgravity at the moment, and each movement, each gesture, required care. Now what? Davis nodded his head, indicating the sick bay door. Let's take it away from here, lad, up in the communication center. I'm coming. McCall, Alex thought, looked drawn and worn, haggard even if that word could be applied to the big, powerfully muscled man. Though his red hair and beard normally gave him the look of someone much younger, despite the streaks of silver at his temples, at the moment he looked every one of his sixty standard years, and then some. He too, Alex realized, was shouldering a certain amount of personal responsibility for Falkirk. The arrest by Wilmarth of Angus McCall, Davis's brother, had been the trigger that had set the whole Caledonian campaign in motion in the first place. McCall was a Caledonian whose family's Jacobite sentiments had led the two Legion officers to get involved with the rebellion and to recommend to Carlyle that the Legion join with the rebels against the tyrant Wilmarth. It had been without any trace of doubt whatsoever, the right thing to do. But, oh God, the cost! Alex took a last look around the sick bay, cluttered with med canisters and electronic monitors. Casualties at Falkirk had been light, considering the odds they'd faced, and only a handful of containers showed the winking constellations of lights and glowing numerals that spoke of injured, cryo-suspended, barely-living flesh within. Casualties at Falkirk had been light. The thought mocked Alex as he pulled his way along, hand over hand, through the close confines of the dropship's partially padded, steel-walled passageways. Even one death or maiming was a tragedy to the victim's family. A battle, any battle, multiplied that grief by scores, by hundreds, by thousands or more. The Endeavour was a Union-class military dropship, 
a 3,500-ton sphere measuring less than 80 meters from bridge dome to primary jets. At the moment, she was docked tail-on to the spinal mount magnetic grapples of an Invader-class jumpship, the free trader Blue Star. Balanced atop a tightly focused stream of charged particles, the 505-meter jumpship was not, properly speaking, in zero-g, but under a constant micro-acceleration of some hundredths of a gravity, the thrust necessary to keep the 152,000-ton starship balanced and more or less motionless against the tug of the local star's gravity, at least for the week it would take to recharge her jump coils. As a result, objects and people adrift within Endeavor's close compartments and passageways tended to drift slowly towards the bulkhead opposite the Blue Star's prow. Maneuvering in micro-G could be tricky, but it was something that mech warriors generally got the hang of by the time they'd made a hyperspace jump or three. Alex barely noticed the low-G tug as he followed McCall out of the sick bay and onto one of the Endeavour's passageways. The dropship's comm shack was located forward, three decks above the sick bay and just below the bridge, though terms like above and below carried little practical meaning in zero-g. It was a small compartment, crowded with both flat-screen displays and a large 3V hollow projection plate. McCall indicated the main flat-screen, mounted beside one of the compartments, two acceleration couches. An HPG message came through from Glengarry a few minutes ago, McCall told him. His eyebrows arched high on his forehead. My mother? Aye, lad. It was your mamer. She's got the situation in hand right now, but it does not look good back there. And, well, I should warn ya, her message was cut off, sudden-like. Alex slid into the chair, pulling the harness across his body and snapping it shut. Let me see it. Aye. McCall touched a control on the arm of Alex's chair. The main comm view screen switched on, showing the Comstar logo. At the lower right, alphanumerics appeared. HPG transmission. 9th of May, 3057. One way, non-priority. Glengarry to Gladius. Recorded for in-system transmission. Code Blue Sierra 25. As they watched, the five changed to a four, three, two, one. The image faded out, replaced by the face of Alex's mother. At fifty-six years standard, Lori Kalmar Carlyle was still a handsome woman, the hard lines of her face betraying more of her character than they did of age. Her once blonde hair was nearly all prematurely silver now, which made her eyes dark and intense by comparison. She looked tired, and there was a crisp edge of no-nonsense professionalism in her voice that Alex knew covered a well-hidden worry. Hello, Davis, she said. And Alex, I presume you're there too. Things are getting worse around here. The image flickered, then shifted to another view, one obviously taken from an aircraft or drone, high above the city of Dunkeld. Glengarry's capital was spread out for Alex's inspection like a scale model miniature, tiny buildings rising among the patchwork waves of green marking the city's parks. North of the city, a bare-faced and eroded hill rose like the crown of a brown and weathered skull. Sprawled across its crest were the black slick walls and weapon towers of Castle Hill, the Legion's fortress. Alphanumerics winked at the bottom of the screen, showing date, time, and the legend. Drone 7. Download direct feed. 
Real-time transmission of full color, as it happened imagery like this, was hideously expensive. And the three V holocausts favored by the rich and powerful of the inner sphere were even more so. Most HPG transmissions were carried out in text only, or with small images, in compressed squirts of data lasting a millisecond or less. Longer messages, 3Vs, or real-time 2V transmissions like this one, required much longer transmission times, and could be put out over the HPG net only when general traffic was light. Comstar charged obscene amounts of C-bills for high data services when they were able to provide them at all. But it was worth it sometime in the amount of data that could be conveyed. Usually, these techniques were reserved for news transmissions of import to the entire inner sphere. But the great house governments and those independent military units that could afford them sometimes took advantage of the immediacy of the intelligence they afforded. It would be another four standard days, however, before the jump ship Blue Star would have its jump drive charged and able to carry the Grey Death's 3rd Battalion that final 18 light years to Glengarry. The laws of physics and of Kiarni Fushida jump drives being what they were, there was no way they could reach Glengarry's system in less than another hundred hours or so. Why had his mother authorized the considerable expense of a direct feed live transmission, knowing that the military intelligence it contained would be four days out of date by the time 3rd Bat arrived? Unless she feared that 3rd Battalion would arrive too late to help. Goaded by a sharp stab of worry, Alex leaned forward, studying the insect-like metallic shapes that were scrawling white contrails through the sky. Between the high-flying drone and Dunkel's tower tops, or stalking along the city streets. The battle was well underway, and to judge by the damage already inflicted on the city, it had already been raging for a day or two at least. Missiles slashed through the air like flights of arrows, impacting in silently flaring gouts of light and smoke. A turret, squat and ugly, atop one of the fortress towers, pivoted rapidly, and a dazzling sliver of blue light flickered unsteadily from the muzzle of its PPC. Three hundred meters from the fortress, moving along one of the streets of Dunkeld, a ponderous and almost comical caricature of a human lurched unsteadily as flame blossomed close by its left side. Comparison with the buildings on either side showed the machine's height to be something just over ten meters. Alex's experienced eye ID'd the thing at a glance. One of the new 30-ton battle mechs from Defiance Industries on Hesperus II. That meant the attackers were indeed fed calm, as the first messages from Glengarry had suggested. After the initial landings, Lori's voice said, as the drone's camera panned across fortress and city. Gareth's forces moved fast, faster than we really expected. Major Franco's original assessment was that this was some kind of snatch-and-grab raid, but these people obviously had a detailed deployment all worked out in advance. They knew exactly where they wanted to go, and how they were going to get there. We weren't able to assemble a blocking force until they'd already offloaded and started closing on Dunkeld from three directions. Manuel Franco was the senior intelligence officer remaining back at Legion HQ. A good man with a strong tactical sense. But Alex wondered how good the man's guesswork had been this time. There were a lot more mechs down there than any quick raid would justify. Alex was counting and cataloging enemy mechs as the image transmitted from the drone shifted the field of view. Some were older, well-known models, marauders, a pair of comically stilting Jenners, an ancient-looking but powerful thunderbolt. Most of them, however, were more recent or less common designs. 
one huge machine, roughly humanoid but stooped, with a dorsal armor plate like a small disc-shaped aircraft on its back, he recognized as an 80-ton PPR 5S salamander. That was another Defiance Industries design, and a new one. So far as Alex knew, only a handful had ever been built so far, and most of these had been assigned to regions bordering clan territory. They hit us two days ago at Colwyn, when we tried to block them, Lori's voice continued, as more mechs, accompanied by a trio of heavily armored hovercraft personnel carriers, moved into view. At least one full battalion against First Bat's third company. They killed three of our mechs at the price of two of their own, and our people were forced to fall back before they were cut off. As you can see, the invaders have a fair number of heavies, along with supporting infantry and armored vehicles. This is definitely not just a raiding party. Everywhere the drone camera panned, more of the invader mechs were visible. Alex had already counted thirty, nearly a full battalion's worth, moving in and about the Dunkeld itself. We now believe we're facing at least three battalions, plus a battalion of infantry, some long-range artillery, and a wing of aerofighters, Lori continued. That number is based on the number of dropships we tracked inbound, as well as the reports brought back by our recon people and relayed by scout drones. With 2nd Battalion deployed to Kintyre for maneuvers, I ordered the rest of our people to fall back to Castle Hill. I don't like abandoning Dunkel to them, but I didn't see that we had much choice. I lass, McCall said softly, almost under his breath. Or like no choice at all. Two battalions of the Grey Death Legion, the first and the second, remained on Glengarry, while the third, plus the headquarters lance of the first, had deployed to Caledonia. Hook's second battalion had been scheduled to deploy to Kintyre, the smallest of Glengarry's free sprawling northern hemisphere continents, for training maneuvers, and it sounded as though the invasion had caught them while they were out. That left just first battalion, minus the headquarters lands, to face three attacking battalions. Lori had done exactly the right thing. Pulling her available forces back, and hunkering down inside the fortress at Castle Hill. If the attackers tried to dig them out, they'd find it a long, slow, and expensive process. That also meant I had to abandon the spaceport, Lori said. Her voice was tight, the words hard-edged, and a bit too precise. I am sorry about that, but there was simply no other way to save what's left of 1st Battalion. At the moment, Gareth's people pretty much have the run of both the port and the city. So far, the castle's defenses are holding. We have plenty of food, the wells are operating, and if we husband our expendable munitions, we should be able to make them last until you boys get here. The view shifted to a close-up of the fortress, ebon surfaces gleaming in Glengarry's warm orange light. Alex was still orienting himself when an attacking aerofighter streaked into view. It was a Corsair, a House Davian design, with the bold Fist and Sun emblem of the Federated Commonwealth on its wings. A heartbeat, after it entered Alex's field of vision, missiles flashed from beneath the fighter's nose, arrowing into the fortress on tightly drawn threads of white smoke. Air attacks have been heavy, Lori was saying, but so far we've managed... Then the volley of missiles struck, with a silently pulsing ripple of flashes, and with the third flash, the screen suddenly dissolved in a storm of static. Lori's voice, too, was lost in the steady hiss of white noise. Alex waited for his mother's voice to pick up the thread of her monologue again, 
but the hissing static went on and on until suddenly the screen blanked. Replaced a moment later by the Comstar logo and a brief and uninformative message. Transmission interrupted at source. Alex wasn't sure what the target had been. He thought, though, that the missiles had been heading for the cluster of communications antennae high atop Castle Hill's vaulted carapace. It had to have been the destruction of an HPG antenna that had cut his mother's transmission off in mid-sentence. It had to be. Davis. Alex continued staring at the unhelpful message on the screen, willing the image transmitted from above Dunkeld to return. Gently, McCall reached down and switched off the recording. Come on, lad, he said. Let's go down to the lounge and sit a spell. Davis, you don't think... Think, lad. Those missiles struck fair among the big antennae up on the fortress roof, McCall said with his broadest Scots burr. You must keep in mind that it is not so bad as it seems. That strike we saw at the end likely put a wee missile or three into the hyperpulse antennae atop Castle Hill and damaged it or nudged it out of line before the transmission was complete. It was the antenna that went down, not your maimer. I know that, Alex replied, taking a breath and trying to steady his reeling senses. From that bit we saw of her, it looked like she was in ops when she made that transmission. A hundred meters down and shielded by five meters of ferrocrete and starlig hull metal. But she's cut off, surrounded by those bastards and outnumbered more than three to one. Aye, but if anyone can hold out against that lot, it's Lieutenant Colonel Kalmar Carlyle. She's a fighter, that one. But how can she hold out? Against three battalions. In a stand-up fight, probably not. But in a siege, your mom knows better than to sally out against the likes of Brandel Gareth. She'll sit tight and make him come to her. I cannot believe anyone would want that wee planet bad enough to take that kind of losses. McCall gestured with a jerk of his bearded head toward the comshack door. Come on, lad. Let's find a place to sit and have a wee talk. Numb, Alex followed. It was so difficult to banish the evidence of his senses. And with his father in a medical coma, with enemy forces closing in back home, it was beginning to look as though the very life of the Grey Death Legion was at stake, and Alex could see no way at all to better the odds.